This episode of the Off-Road Podcast is sponsored by Colby Valve. Off-Road Podcast, episode 454, prepping for wheeling season. Tonight, Aaron goes to Memorial, Koi experiences the cataclysmic power of the eclipse, and Ben talks about his new rig. Welcome to the Off-Road Podcast, a podcast about everything off-road. We cover the news, review products, and interview people in the off-road industry. Your hosts tonight are Aaron, Coy, and my name is Ben, and welcome to the Off-Road Podcast. Coy, I've got hair about this cataclysmic power that you experienced. Well, uh, you're, you're really, you're really quiet, Ben. Was I really quiet? You were just off the yeah, mic. You're, oh, off the I, mic. Yeah, I think you're off the mic, yes. I, you know, I was uh, obviously satire since we're going out live now. Uh, or, or way less people got raptured than they actually said at first. Like, maybe it is a lot harder to get to heaven than we think, and none of us made it. Only and like we just, you know, there's so few that we haven't heard about it yet. It's possible. It's uh, very possible. I mean, even if it was easier, I wasn't expecting to go, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was cloudy here. A bunch of people at work like, oh, we're still going to get 30% in Oregon. It's going to be awesome. And it didn't have the power to move clouds. So just saying, just saying, I've noticed that the moon has the power to move the entire ocean around, but all the clouds in Oregon that are like filled with water doesn't move those at all. I'm not obviously a scientist. <laughs> But I find it fishy. Not a flat earth guy either, but I'd like someone to explain why the clouds don't move for me with the moon. So should be some kind of tidal situation there. It makes sense if you think about it and you're completely uneducated like me. It's the government and they're hydro seeding the, the clouds. Obviously, it's something they didn't put in the holocram that's above us. And then yeah. they need to program tidal, <laughs> uh, a weather tidal movement. That could uh, be. Aaron? I think you had a much more exciting weekend than me because I didn't really get up to much other than prepare for the apocalyptic lunar eclipse. Uh, yeah, so uh, I can't remember. I think I mentioned that I got my truck back, but I know I didn't tell you guys this part. So the the guy's shop who I had it at, um, he is he's the, the shop that I did my engine swap at, which is in the middle of town. Uh, my little one flashing light town. And uh, so I dropped it off with him Sunday night. He had it for a few days. And before he welded the exhaust back together, he, I, I'm guessing he used a cell phone, but he had a decibel meter and he ran the decibel meter by the exhaust. And he said it was 116 decibels before he put things together. He revved the motor a bunch of times. Uh, and about five minutes later, one of the local cops comes by and says, was that you revving the engine? And he said, yeah, yeah, that was me. He's like, I heard you all the way over by the Catholic church, which is like four blocks away, um, <laughs> across town, four blocks is across town for us. So that yeah, made me, uh, feel a little good that it, it caught the attention of the local police department, um, with how loud the exhaust was. So 116 decibels after he was done, it was 92 decibels, which is still pretty loud. Uh, I believe in chump car, um, and other crap can racing. I think 95 decibels was the max you could be on racetracks. 96. So, yeah. 96. Uh, most, yeah. Usually 96. I don't know about chump, but like it's generally most of the racing series I'm aware of 96. So yeah, you're good to go. 92, good to go. Ready 92, to race. 92 decibels. That's like Dodge caravan levels. It's, kind of kind of <laughs> wussy now probably <laughs> yeah um yeah eric loud pipes save lives uh i so in the uh, tonight aaron goes to a memorial this past weekend i was down in florence oregon where i did not realize that this uh famed event took place in uh in that town exploding whale memorial park there's a park in town you mean seaside no, this is uh, Florence. I was in Florence. Apparently, they've blown up a lot of whales on the Oregon coast, and apparently, it's this possible. We might whale. have to do some, might have to do some Google foo. But uh, I'm, I, that's where this park was. 
was in Florence, Oregon, the Exploding Whale Memorial Park. So if you don't know about it, back in the day, some giant whale beached itself and they thought the best way to dispose of its rotting carcass was to uh, dynamite it. And uh, it like blew up into giant chunks. Some pieces fell down. One hit the news reporter in the head. Another one like smashed a car. So um, that's yep, just a little bit saying in his Florence, Oregon, 1970. There you it's, go. Uh, I like that it uh, completely and utterly crushed a Cadillac. Like, <laughs> I just they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> I've I've talked about this so many times with my friends, but you absolutely know there was just since I work construction, I have a feeling that this is how it went. Like they're like, all these people are there, and since the beach is technically highway, the road department was there. And all these talking heads were like, hey, how do we get rid of this whale? And there was some grizzly construction worker in the back. Like, put 12 cases of dynamite under it and just blow it up. And, you He's know, he kind of said it in sarcasm. And then a bunch of button-up white shirts turned down. Like, that's a great idea. And he went, oh, my God. They, I can do this? And he just, like, and just went with it. Because there's no way that anyone should believe that's a good idea, especially somebody who knows how to use dynamite. Like, oh. Uh. <laughs> Um, Nick says, I'm betting the Cadillac drove out of there. So that's a good, there's a good probability. I, I wish we had the time to look it up. It's pretty flat. It was like a 700 pound piece of blubber that landed on it from the upper atmosphere. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the last part was after I picked my truck up, um, from my buddy, I brought, I turned around and I brought my, uh, off-road camp trailer to him and, uh, he was going to be welding up a little hitch on the back. Here's a picture. Uh, we cut up in the bumper, torched it open, slid a, a receiver into it so I can put like a bike rack on the back. So um, here I've got it kind of painted up with some primer, getting ready to uh, clean it the rest of the way, and then we'll get a good coat of paint on it. Um, and when I dropped it off to him, I, I was just crawling around underneath it, and I noticed um, this crack in the frame. So I've got in this photo, you can see it's ground clean so we can weld it up but i've got like a an a-frame tongue on this trailer uh which you'll see in another picture and then i noticed another crack this is on the tongue so my tongue is actually two pieces i didn't have a full length piece of metal it's that's a four by four square tube and it's quarter inch wall and that's where it was welded together so apparently my welds didn't hold after eight years of abuse so uh we, he welded it up here's some pictures of everything welded up then i ground the welds down and then we played it over top of it so got her she's good to go now and nice. uh nice to see that it uh you guys reinforced it too afterwards yep i'm dragging it to south dakota so had i not caught that uh i probably would have lost a trailer coming to her from south dakota so i'm kind of surprised you didn't do any um plug welds with it too yeah just uh, extra strength yeah i think it i think it'll be fine with uh with those plates on there so there's a lot of weld there those are really thick plates so it should be good and yeah. And so I also, on the very front of it, it takes a lot of abuse from the gravel and the dirt. So I sanded the front of that down and I've got that primered up at the same time. So that's what's going on in this picture. So anyways, going to get a little bit, a little bit of paint job on that uh, trailer when, uh, probably this week, hopefully next week, I can tell you that I did that. Nice. So Ben, how about you? What have you been up to? Well, I uh, made it back alive from Montana, and I guess I should come clean because I got messages um, personally on Facebook and uh, a few phone calls um, of what happened to my Toyota. And apparently I have played the best April Fool's prank ever, um, if you can how, guess. How many of those people were like, thank God this finally happened. This is a blessing in disguise, Ben. You're going to be no. able to upgrade from this. No. 
<laughs> like when those, those fake breakup posts and they call up and be like, I never liked your girlfriend. And you're like, yeah, it was a joke. Oh, I mean, I, I do. I was just. Yeah. <laughs> nope. I, I, I played a really good joke. Um, we actually did take the minivan. Um, and I don't think I shared on the show that my son actually switched out the shocks, the rear shocks on it. Um, thank you, Badlands. Um, we, uh, I helped him because you know. Okay, good. I'm, I'm not trusting an 11 year old to switch out shocks, but by himself. By himself, yes. Yeah. No. Uh, I'm gonna. I want to just cut you off for a quick second. Yesterday, I had my son replace the toilet seat on his toilet, um, specifically because I did not want to be the one down there losing in the nuts, and it took quite a while to replace the toilet seat so i can imagine replacing shocks on a minivan yeah um it didn't actually only took us uh about an hour and a half the 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 uh yeah i i get you i get you no no not not going nissan yet um but i did actually have a close encounter with the deer and that's why i switched to elk um Yes, Travis, you did call it. Um, oh, Travis called it. He knew our show last week was an April Fool's show. Yeah, oh, He saw I mean, right through it. Had you listened all the way to the end, you would have gotten that. <laughs> you know, the whole show was a joke. I, I came up last minute. I think it was the night before. I was like, you know what? I'm going to say I hit a deer. And then I was like, you know what? Deer is not good enough for this one. It's got to be an elk. So I still uh, think you should have went with a bison. I mean, it's a little spicier. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, though I probably would have needed some black eyes for that one. It was, it was be big. Honestly, if it was, was an elk and if it would have gotten its uh, horns through the uh, rack through the windshield, that would have sucked. But anyways, um, yeah, so we came back from Montana, spent time with family. Uh, then we went to um, Miller, Sylvania State Park and did some camping as a family. Um, it was a little muddy because um, it was raining. Our campsite uh, where you see this mud puddle right here was completely flooded along with the back half of my campsite. But we had three sites because we had friends and family there. So uh, we used another site uh, for our fires and stuff. So uh, bonfires and all that. We were celebrating my birthday, which is today. I'm an old person now. So I'm a whole 12 years old now, guys. Or at least it feels like it. And a half. <laughs> Yeah, and 12 and a half. Well, yeah, happy like I said earlier, happy birthday, Ben. Yeah, thanks, buddy. I'm um glad yeah. you I'm glad you uh, survived another year. Yep, I survived it's another year. It's a it's a shocker that you survived, but it, it yeah. is quite shocking. I'm amazed every day I wake up. Um but it, how the uh, intro went with the uh, talking about my new rig, I did notice something really surprising and really happy. Because my rig does feel like a new rig with that tune. I got 13.5 miles per gallon coming home. So I drove to Miller, Sylvania, and I got like 12 and a half gallons per miles per gallon. And 13 and a half coming back because I was coming downhills. And then I only had one to crawl up. Um, and I got like 14 and a half um, total. Or no, 13 and a half total for the trip. And I'd gone back and forth to Bonnie Lake once because I had to go to a soccer game. So I'm, I'm happy with my tune. No struggling on the hill. What do you normally get? Um, before the tune, I was getting 10. Did you tow a trailer? With the trailer. I was getting 10 okay. with the trailer. So and you're up to thir I'm 12, up to 13 with the trailer now? 12, 13 with the trailer, yeah. And I'm averaging uh, about 13 and a half, 14.2. I like how everybody's like, oh, I went and bought this little Toyota instead of this full size Ford diesel because it's just got such horrible mileage. I got like 19 miles per gallon in my Ford. And then they buy a Toyota and then they put 33s on it. Then they get 12 miles a gallon. Like, yeah. I've known like 20 guys that did that. I was like, oh, yeah, it's so much cheaper than driving your full size, isn't it? Way yeah. cheaper. Yeah. way cheaper yeah but uh i'm really happy with it um i just more reasons to get a tune if you haven't got one um so yeah 
Um, but we got some listener feedback here. Um, Luke C wrote in. We talked about this briefly last week, um, but we had to save it so that they got real feedback, not April Fool's feedback. Uh, I'm wanting to build my 2018 F-150 for wheeling, but I'm not sure where to start. And I'm looking for some pointers on how to get started. So I was reading it. Lift I read the that. front, drop the rear. No, do, do not donk it. So I've got some questions. What type of wheeling do you want to do? Um, I personally wouldn't go above a three inch lift because that's when you're chopping cross members and all that. So go just for a three inch suspension lift, um, Icon, Radflow, um, Fox, and I'm trying to think. Uh, BDS, I think, makes a uh, all make three inch lifts. Um, you can go with some Deaver rear springs instead of a spacer spring or an Ada leaf. I think they're Deavers uh, or AAC. Is that the na name of the other leaf company? There's another company that makes uh, uh, there's leaf. Alcan. Alcan is one of the names, but I don't. Yeah, yeah Alcan. There we go. Yeah. I knew it started with an A. Um, so you could go with a full leaf pack instead of going the route of an add a leaf. If you want to go that route, it depends upon your budget. Um, shoot me, shoot us some messages. Um, and then I'll do like a follow, follow up feedback with you with this on air. But I would go three inches of lift and it kind of depends upon where you want to go, what you want to do on your build. I go lift wheels, tires, and then depending upon what you're doing, are you overlanding? Are you wanting to try and do some harder rock crawling stuff? Which personally, I wouldn't really recommend for an F-150. Chuck's got the budget build here. He's suggesting uh, Super Duty axles, lockers, speed locks, 42s, gears, four link, and coilovers. So that's probably about the cheapest way to do it. So I don't know if you really want to go on the cheap route. Yeah. I'm going to be totally honest. The, both Ben's idea and Chuck's great builds. Yeah. It, it but, really just but, comes down to what you want to but, do. But when it comes down to it, I don't care what you're building it for, bigger tire equal better. So we get ourselves, let's put all our money in 37 inch tires. You can get a lift level spacer kit and get that thing up there with just like a two inch lift. You can't stuff 37s under F-150. You can get some bushwhacker flares for like $279. Sawzall, what you got a Sawzall. Be gentle and nice, you know, as gentle as you can with a Sawzall, I guess. Uh, you know, don't use a cutting torch, is what I'm saying. Uh, maybe a jigsaw. Throw those bushwhackers on there. Run 37s. Done. Like, what, what else do you need? And you're into that. The price of a set of tires, two or three Sawzall blades, and price of a bushwhacker flares, and a Daystar lift level. It's going to be like $89. I'd throw a, a can of paint in there just to oh, touch yeah. up the... So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would just say uh, another thing is we've got a news article here coming up um, that you may want to listen to too Access. as an option. Um, uh, but, yeah, Bad, Badlands says get the tube chassis Raptor kit. That's actually one of our news stories this week, Badlands. It is. Um, but before we get to that, we've got to um, we've got a voicemail. It's very... Wait, wait. Uh, somebody from Twitch's handle is can you burp on command? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we, <all right. laughs> hey, he says, he says that's weak. That's amazing. <laughs> you didn't ask if I could do a good one. You said if I could. All right. I have answered the parameters. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, voicemail time. We got a voicemail and. Uh, well, this one's a doozy, guys. Hello, this is George Vanderlei. I am calling from Benjamin Dover and Tackett. Uh, we're a law firm that represents a number of major vehicle manufacturers, and oddly enough, Taco Bell. Um, we're calling about your show that you aired on, let's see, the 1st of April. We had a, a guest on named Andy. Um, we're asking, uh, well, we're pursuing retention of records for that show uh, it seems that uh, this Andy guy shared some proprietary 
photos of some uh, vehicles and products that um, we are planning to come out with and uh, or that, that these manufacturers are planning to come out with. And they were not to be shared. We've taken care of it on our end. Uh, there's been a number of terminations, and we are now working on a, a lawsuit for industrial espionage, so I suggest you comply with our requests uh, unless you would like to lose all the money that you make by pr producing this show. Um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Joke's on you. We make no money. I would like them to take all the money. Yes. <laughs> Holy <laughs> mess, Joe. I will trade you that episode for all the money. Yep, all yeah. the money. Yeah, bring it on. Let's just hit them with a bill for hosting fees. Be like, this is <laughs> this is actually this is actually negative. This is what you're responsible for now. Yeah. What if we send them a bill for advertisement? Like, yeah, we no, we were advertising for you. You didn't realize that we were one of the sponsors. Yeah, you owe yeah. us all the money. So yeah, yeah, that was um, again. Um, I cannot state it enough, but you got to call the spotter hotline, um, stuff like yeah, that. What's that? What's that phone number? 605, 605 spotter. spotter. So yeah, definitely worth it. Do it. And, uh, yeah. We also want to thank our sponsor, Patriot patch, head over to patriotpatch.co and check out their selection of great patches, shirts, cleaning mats, signs, and stickers. You can also join the patch of the month club for 15 bucks and receive a patch matching sticker and artist proof each month. Um, Hey, we, we, from uh Kenny perp on command, best burp wins. Um, they'll donate to the winner. Aaron, you got one in you? I got nothing. But what I do have is this no, month's I don't Patriot one. patch. This month's Patriot patch. It is a uh, Easter themed. We've got uh, Claymore that says you found me on it. Some hand painted grenades and some uh, more grenades. There we go. Now we focused. My and they've got some that patch. She what? My daughter's in love with that patch. Did she um, take it to school on her backpack? No. <laughs> I actually gave her, the, I gave her the sticker so it could end up on something at her school. We'll see. Uh, can you burp on command? Call our hotline 605 spotter. Let's see what you have. All right. Stop trying to talk us into it live. I want to hear yours. There you go. Call in. There we go. That's what you got. I, I don't I don't think it's as good as you act. I, I I tried and I couldn't get anything out. I can't really. Yeah, I got well, nothing. I'm also. the default winner. Then you have to give me money. Uh, at least enough to pay for uh, Dr Pepper for Koi. Um, we've got uh, some other Patriot patches that they just dropped. So this one says "Kneel for the Cross, Stand for the Flag." Uh, here's another one called Barrel Burners. So this is some hand loads that uh, apparently someone has uh, put a little too much powder in. Maybe they were having some too much of this this one says i'm a neat guy it's a tumbler that's very full of something that you would have neat so yeah check out patriot patch they got some cool stuff have tire troubles ever left you deflated colby valve has got you covered Ever have a valve stem leak? Colby Valve makes reusable and easily replaceable valve stems that don't require you to remove your tire from the wheel. They work with your off-road rig, ATV, side-by-side, -side, commuter vehicle, or even your tractor. Never be left stranded again because of a busted valve stem. They also have a tire repair kit for those punctures that keep you away from doing your favorite thing, wheeling. Make sure to check out colbyvalve.com or ask for them at your local off-road product store. I, I I got one in the chamber. Uh, there we go. This this episode's going to be almost as explicit as last week. Uh, <laughs> uh, Leroy, I, I love a milkshake. Purple. Colby Valve uh, just brought us the news, so let's do this. This first one is from the drive, and it is the Ford Transit Trail off road van recalled. Because 30-inch tires don't fit. Um, 
it's, it's kind of hilarious. So fitting larger wheels and tires to our cars, you always run the risk of tire rub. That's why many enthusiasts leave the upgrades to the car makers themselves rather than trying to outsmart them. I don't agree with that at all. I'm not sure who wrote this article. But even OEMs can get it wrong, as in the case of the Ford Transit Trail. Um, as outlined in the NHTSA recall document, Ford opened an investigation upon receiving a complaint from an upfitter. The unnamed company said it knew of four instances of its vehicles being taken into dealers with noise complaints, which turned out to be its 30 inch Goodyear Wrangler front tires rubbing on the fender liner and frame. Ooh, and frame. That is a bad one. Yeah. Um, it's a common problem with modified cars and vehicles. Uh, I I bet you I'm, all of us have rubbed tires on our vehicles before. I'm still currently rubbing tire. You mean yeah. like today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it shouldn't be, though, for factory vehicles. You're supposed to be able to count on automakers to vet this stuff. Nevertheless, Ford performed an inner inner Ford performed an engineering evaluation anyways and found the cause was how the transit was adapted into the trail. Ford discovered that the transit trail's front axle is loaded to near its gross weight. Sorry, when the transit trail is loaded to near its gross vehicle weight, um, there are scenarios that can cause a tire to rub. An example was when under braking with 60% or more of the steering lock applied, you might encounter it. Uh, and this can happen in a parking lot or driving down a narrow trail. You'd think Ford wouldn't make this mistake because, you know, they're producing the Raptors and the Broncos and the Rangers and things like that and Crown Vicks on 37s. Um, but it turns out that Ford contracted out the transit trails development to a company that didn't know any better. A vehicle modifier contracted by Ford did not fully account for the front tire envelope and packaging requirements of this application, the recall document states. Ford said as it is determining the exact cause of the tire rub, though it seems obvious. The company warns that unaddressed rub could damage fender liners or even the tires themselves, leading to a loss of pressure and therefore vehicle control. Ford is not aware of any tire damage caused by the oversight yet, but is working on a solution and will notify owners when a recall service is available. So what do you guys think they're going to do? Are they going to do like a, a budget spacer, like a little quarter inch spacer, just to push it down just a little bit more? Or you think they're going to make people put 29s on? I think what they'll do is they'll grab a heat gun and mold that fender liner a little more. Well, well but it's frame. rubbing on the frame. Ooh, yeah. Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Maybe new wheels? To it's a tough it. one because if they add a spacer, don't they kind of have to go through like all the wreck and like roll over? So I yeah. almost think they add a new front spring that is six pounds stiffer or something along those lines. Like it just has to be, yeah. just have to make it past their max weight capacity. So that if it does rub, they're like, oh, we've tested your overweight, you know. It doesn't or, uh, rub unless you're overweight. There's another right thing where they do this. They just go, they just lower the weight rating to whatever it doesn't rub at. And they're like, yeah, it's yeah. actually this. Skinny tires. What if, I don't know what kind of tires they have on them. The article didn't say, but maybe some skinnies. Put some skinnies I, on I them. I remember when they released that they were doing this, we did, we covered this one. Chuck Holt mm -hmm. says they could use a torch and mold the frame a little. I agree, I agree yeah. as well. I'm I'm positive they have to go through crash testing again if they do that. I'm uh, pulling up the tire size calculator here real quick. The photo looks like it says 245.75.16. I'm going to pop that in here real quick. 245.75. 16 that comes out to a nine and a half by 30 and a half so that's already a pretty narrow tire you can't get yeah. much narrower get than that tires dirt bike tires yeah. maybe yeah. some enduro tires put on there side by side tires yeah i 
I, I don't know what they do. I yeah. imagine they I imagine they ignore it for as long as possible because it's not gonna do we're, anything. We're working on a fix. Um we'll let you know when it's done. Uh sorry, this this, this well, line's been discontinued. According to tiresizecalculator.com or tiresize.com, sorry, uh there is another tire similar in size, a 215 85 16. It's a tenth of an inch smaller overall, but it is narrower by one and a half inches. So that means it's going to be it's going to be just over a half inch narrower on the inside. So that might yeah, do but, it. But does that tire exist in like an all terrain or anything, or is it like a trailer tire? You know, um, it yeah, uh, a Turo. Iron Man, Milestar, Kelly Ooh, Tires. All the big grips. Grips. Oh, we got yeah. there. Firestone, kind of... Yokohama, Kumo, General. Are Isn't, they uh, are they all terrain tires? Yeah, they look like all terrain tires. Oh. Does Ford still do business with Firestone? I thought they learned Cooper, BFG. Although that BFG looks doesn't look very off. You gotta think about it. Like I liked your spacer idea. But it's going to be whatever's cheaper for Ford to do. A set of tires is yeah. not cheap. I mean, front springs aren't yeah. cheap either, but uh, yeah. it's going to be whatever it is. It's got to be cheap. Speaking of cheap, should we move on to this next article? Yes, I'm excited about this one. Yeah. All right. This one came from Car and Driver. Now, this one's a little bit older, but it kind of just came to our attention. This is from kind of last fall. Factory 5 XTF reframes the truck conversation. Uh, that was a nice play on the words. You'll see. Uh, uh, the obvious answer to the Transit Raptor Edition long travel. I like that. Uh, yeah. If it's a van, is it still a Raptor? Or do they uh, they make that like a hard end there? Uh, <laughs> just saying. Like a free candy situation. Uh uh, anyways, uh, got about 25,000 of extra cash and a late model Ford F-150. Well, then the factory five racing is the perfect pro project mm. for you. Uh, this newest kit, it's called the XTF and I have no idea what that stands for, but it sounds really cool. And it is transform a stock F-150 and to what is basically a Baja 1000 truck, at least the frame. Uh, this requires building the truck from the frame up. Uh, your idea of a proper suspension means 16 inches of travel up front and 20 inches in the rear, then good news. Uh, this is perfect for you because the stock Ford frame is not wide or not wide enough or strong enough to do that. And uh, for a reference, the Raptor R only has about 13 inches of travel up front and 14 in the rear. So this is more suspension travel than a Raptor R by a bit. Uh, the centerpiece of the XTF kit is an entirely new tube frame that replaces the stock ladder frame. Factory 5 claims the frame weighs 100 pounds more than the Ford item, but is nearly twice as strong using 327 total feet of tubing. Installing it might not be as daunting as you think. Uh, given that the 2015 and later F-150 cab is a self-contained unit, you just unbolt it, unplug the wiring harness, and pull it out of the way with an engine hoist or lift. The cab is watertight, so the XTF interior who's short on I'm not sure that's a misspelling there who's short on space could leave it outside while working on the frame and suspension in the garage so yeah you could just pull your cab off take it out of the shop leave it in the elements for the winter while you're doing the whole frame swap situation it says uh, in it says in tender so maybe they're saying so if you're intending to do this you could just like leave it laying around I, I don't think in tender is a word but I'll, I don't uh, either I don't I'll we're gonna roll with it, it. Yeah, uh, the $24,990 kit is intended for the 2015 220 F-150 4x4 with a 5-liter V8 or turbocharged 3.5-liter V6. Newer, The newer models have changes that make the factory 5 kit incompatible. You'll need to have a crew cab with the 5.5-foot five bed and the 26-gallon fuel tank. And yes, the ideal pre-trunner truck would obviously be a two-wheel drive with a V8, 
But since nobody bought those, they're trying to just do it for the most popular models, essentially. And the actual XTF uh, kit that is being showcased at uh, Factory 5 right now uh, just, you know, was a regular family truck that came out of Michigan. Uh, nothing special. Other than now, it could take on a Raptor R with flared fenders, 37-inch tires, and uh, anything more than a cursory look, uh, the tube frame will give it away. But with uh, the welded lattice work peeking out from below, the rocker panels leading back to the four-link coil spring rear suspension with towering remote reservoir Fox dampers, the bed is aluminum, so on. This truck is mostly filled by the optional... Sorry, the uh, aluminum bed is mostly filled by the optional spare tire. The mount goes for $199. The fiberglass fenders are part of the kit and inflate the XTF to a yawning 90 inches of width, three inches wider than a Raptor R. Consequently, the hood, grill, and tailgate are all factory five items as well. For uh, $6,990, the body components are available in a clear coat carbon fiber, which left unpainted might not be that far off the cost of paint matching fiberglass panels to the cab. I would actually want to know who in the world is doing their painting if it costs $6,000 to, uh, you know, match a hood and front fenders to a cab. But that's, uh, you know, they have better painter than I do, apparently. Yeah, wow. Uh, but uh, that is kind of boy math. Like, I guess I should get the carbon fiber because, you know, it's like it's a wash after painting the glass. So uh, uh, the nose panel is, sorry, uh, the nose panel is carbon fiber no matter what. Other options include rear anti-roll bar for four sixty five and a tow package for $675. The latter includes more than a hitch, bringing the axle limiting straps and a pan hard rod into the equation to tame the torsionist rear suspension during towing. The Factory 5 XTF... Oh, sorry, something there we got added or not deleted. Uh, if you got the res... Re got the mechanical skills the xtf the heck just happened here my screen just moved the xtf kit is an intriguing value proposition for about the price of a raptor you could build a truck with far wilder looks more capability while maintaining the stock ford interior amenities and powertrain reliability hiring someone to build it will likely add nearly twenty thousand dollars but when the time comes to register insure or finance the truck it's just an f-150 with a factory vin rather than yeah. a home built kit car. Of course, Raptors are also upgraded under the hood, but easy mods are there for the taking. This EcoBoost truck included a low restriction intake and exhaust that gave it a Ford GT soundtrack, and Factory 5 is already building a supercharged V8 truck to see what happens when seven or so horsepower, 700 or so horsepower join the party. Have you talked the wife into this yet, Aaron? Uh, <laughs> She's got the right truck, right? She has the right truck, except we've got too long of a bed. So it says you need to five and a half, and we got the six and a half foot bed. I'm sure you could work it out. Find, find a bed. Yeah. And we've also got uh, the wrong fuel tank. So we're going to need a fuel tank or a cell. You just put a fuel cell on there. So I, I went on their website and fully outfitted. The kit costs uh, that's carbon fiber panel upgrade and all the extras it was thirty four thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars that really that isn't that much for a completely custom frame and all the parts and pieces to have something better than a raptor r well yeah. I, what i assume is better i mean you aren't going to have the engine performance of a raptor r but that's a turbo kit and a tune away yeah. if you got the 3.5 it's, it's unclear to me how much of the suspension is in concluded with this and or shocks i mean shocks i mean shocks like that could be five thousand dollars super easily Each. if not more so yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, i'm not i want to included i want to cut back real quick to the width it said it was 90 inches wide i think it was 93 um, was where was that 90. i'm trying to buy it it's 90. Nine zero, nine zero, 90 inches w wide. The H1 Hummer was 86 and a half inches wide. So, so. I, 
I do have to run the Raptor lights so that I have the wide clearance lights then. Like I correct. Even though it's not a Raptor, I have to run the Raptor lights. Yeah. Yep. You'll have to run Raptor lights. You get, I, I you like maybe it. get the Toyota, get the Toyota ones. So you have four of them instead of four three. Of them, yeah. You'd be different. I think it's pretty cool. I think this is an amazing um, value is the right word. I think I'm trying to find. Um, yeah. And the fact that you could do this at home, you just pull things off and put things back on. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too tough. Yeah, if you can it, engine swap something, you can do this. Uh, Leroy engineering pointed out the welds being so clean. He also said that you probably need to move that uh, remote reservoir hose in that last photo. Uh, it yeah. looks like it's it looks like it's rubbing on the chassis there. Yeah. So uh, I think I think it's a great value. I'm not the go fast desert guy though, so it's it's only appealing to me in the sense that you could have some super sweet long travel business, but. Um, you just really have to have the right place to take this. You need the dunes. Um, you need some some place with lots of sand. Living I, in like Reno would be awesome for this. Oh yeah, I would just love to see someone in California like do all the stuff to this, and then they gotta go do their smog whatever test where they make sure everything's like stock and kosher, and like it's got a VIN, passes emissions. Dude just glances underneath. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> it's just all <laughs> yeah. <tough>, right? <laughs> Yeah. Still the same truck. Yeah, you got to buy tires and stuff too. So it's it is really going to add up, but to have better performance than the Raptor R is a big deal. To just take an F150 to a shop and be like, "Hey, I need this all done up." It's going to be like 100 grand. So, yeah. I am surprised they use square tube. I was expecting when I heard tube frame for it to be round, but I don't know any different. So, I just don't know. You guys ready for the main topic? I'm ready, ready for the main topic. Let's do it. So this week we're talking about preparing for wheeling season. Um, or for you fair weather wheelers. I guess it's prepping for wheeling season is the actual title of the show. So um, we got something going on in the comments here. Uh, somebody's going to hire somebody's daughter to do some welding because they can do better welding than the welds in the picture. So that's, that's exciting. Someone's got a career in welding coming up. Just has to move to Ohio. All right, Coy, why don't you kick it off here? You kind of put in this little first chunk and then we're going to just hit some, uh, some bullet points and sections and work our way through this. And at the very end, after we're done talking about rigs, we'll pop in a little bit and talk about trailers since I clearly had, uh, to fix my trailer before wheeling season. Uh, yeah, so, you know, prepare for seasonal differences is the kind of what this is starting out at. Maybe your wheeling s season is winter. So, like, <laughs> this summer is your off season. I don't know. But some of us kind of wheel somewhat year-round. So, prepare for seasonal differences. So, in the spring, a lot of mud and runoff. It uh, gets a little swampy out there, depending on what part of the country, so on and so forth that you're in. But uh, here in the Northwest, you know, Swap that snow shovel out for just a standard spade. Snow shovel, if you ever use it in the mud, man. <laughs> not cool. Not cool, yeah. bro. Straight up not a good time. Uh, you know, maybe carry an extra or an, uh, carry a pair of rubber boots, stick them in the uh, back there somewhere. I've been in some mud holes where I really wished I had a pair of rubber boots. I've been in a few where I wish I had waders, honestly. Uh, maybe a couple rolls of paper towels. I've made the mistake of not, I try to keep wet wipes or something in my cab now, but where you get stuck you get to, you know your mud up to your elbows hooking up some recovery equipment and then you go to jump back in your truck and you just you know cover the interior in mud which is fine depending on what vehicle you are in but if it's your daily driver too you probably don't want to just cover the interior in mud so it's wet wipes maybe some paper towels or something make sure you got that uh time to take off the snow tires and put your you know your summer or off-roading tires on a lot of people especially in the uh eastern half of the united states run a dedicated winter tire those generally absolutely are horrid in mud so uh something like that uh 
throw a couple folded up trash bags somewhere in your truck. It's really nice to yeah. right here. Uh, I'm just AK Ford fan oh. says I always pack waiters. I've been over the top a couple times. That's <clears throat> that's some a serious mud hole. You're cooler than me. I give you that. Uh, AK Ford fan. He drives that cool Bronco. I seen a video of it or something. Maybe he wrote to us. I don't remember. I know he drives some kind of cool. Oh, he's going to be in uh, Moab the same time we are. Yes. Yeah. Is. Yeah, man. Can't wait yeah. to see you there. He's gonna buy. He's gonna buy us dinner. Yeah, yeah, That's he's good. uh buying us dinner and rounds at the bar, I heard. So he's uh he's a, a generous man. So yeah, super excited uh, to meet him. It's nice to keep a couple trash bags. Honestly, it's kind of almost a year-round thing. You can use them to pick up trash, but sometimes, especially if you have an SUV, you've covered all your recovery gear in mud. Just be all throwing a trash can before you get home. Or I mean sorry, not trash can, trash bag before you get home is uh nice. And this is one, at least in the Northwest where I'm in bug repellent for the spring, man, you get up in the mountains and there are swarms of man eating mosquitoes that will carry you away. Like you, it will ruin your day and weekend. It just, it ruins everything. I hate it. And then summer fire season, another seasonal difference, depending on where you're at. Maybe it's already summer there. <laughs> you're someplace where it's warm already. Uh, it's been all winter throw a thing of sunscreen in there i think we've all been out there where you can feel the burn happening and you realize you're just gonna have to eat it like it's just you're just gonna be burnt it's noon honestly, on your honestly, ears honestly in spring it's not a bad idea to pack that sunscreen um especially if you're going through some of that spring snow that sun reflecting back at you when i was a boy scout uh doing a hike around mount st helens i got uh sunburn from the sun hitting the snow on the ground and uh, I got sunburn on my eyelids because I didn't have my sunglasses. It sucked. So uh, sunscreen's good. Sunscreen. Uh, you're going to want to carry extra water for you to drink. Just, it's just nice to have. And then for fire season, the big four are a gallon jug of water and that's not a gallon of water. It needs to be a gallon jug of water, something that holds one gallon at once, not 90 water, you know, water bottles an extinguisher an ax and a shovel. Those are like the four things you should have in the Northwest. In fact, there are times of the year where if you're in the mountains without those, you can get a ticket. So I like uh, to just bring a five gallon bucket. Cause you, you can do a lot with a bucket or in a bucket. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't hurt to bring a bucket, uh, sunglasses and or brimmed hat, uh, in the summertime, especially if something happens where you're just going to be sitting out there and there's not shade, especially, uh, like I've, like many, uh, men have converted to solar power up top. So without, I don't like to wear a hat, but in the summertime, man, sometimes you just got to wear one or you'll, you'll just peel all the skin off the top of your skull. And then sunglasses, sometimes they end up coming out of the car in the winter In the spring, you're not using them. And it's maybe it's your wheeling rig. You don't run it all the time. Then you go out. Mm. You don't have your sunglasses. So something to check on. Ben, you want to uh, you want to burn through some more of this checklist? Yeah, let's uh, let's start off with uh, checking your tires. I am the local tire ex expert here, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so inspect that tread depth uh, and condition. I mean, look for chunking and all that. Might be a good time to replace your tires if they're chunked out. Uh, look for some weather checking or deep cuts. Um, it's a good time to rotate them. Um, you should realistically be rotating your tires every other oil change at least. Um, consider upgrading your tires if needed. Um, don't worry. Also check that full. Don't forget to check that full size spare. It uh, really sucks when you go to put that spare tire on and there's no air in it. And you did not bring your air compressor or it broke um is your emphasis tire... emphasis on the full size full size yes you should have a full size matching spare um you know check that your uh check your tire wear see if you've got some cupping going on um could be you know you need to replace some tie rod ends or something um uh the the sooner you notice that the sooner that you get that uh part fixed and you don't need to replace your tires a whole lot earlier. Earlier, um, on, replace, man, you said the sooner you notice that your tie rod is worn, then the. <laughs> what if like one of your friends notices it's worn and warns you 
months ahead of time. You actually listen to your friend and do not ignore your friend. <laughs> this is checking. Like they're they're looking out for your best interests. They re really are. AK Ford fan says, "What if my spare is bald?" I hey, there's it, nothing wrong with bald. Okay, some yeah, of us bald is beautiful. Bald actually means it's more burly. It's so much testosterone that it actually, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. If your spare is bald, you need to get one of those tire groovers and put some tread back on it yeah. or a good sharpie. I mean, honestly, if it's a used tire <laughs> um, and it's a trail spare, it's got some damage and whatnot, if it's good enough to get you off the trail, that's great, but you still should be checking that it's got air in it. It holds air. It's it's going to get you off the trail. That's the important part. As long as it's good bald, enough to get you off the trail. Bald tires work at Moab. Ask Aaron. He knows. I, I, I know. Yeah. I, bald isn't a strong enough word. There's not enough letters. You know? Yeah. Like you had racing slicks. Like I've seen Draxers. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen rear engine Draxers with more tread than those tires have. Yeah, that's why um, going down um, whatever that pass in Colorado that's super scary in the rain wasn't as easy for me as it was for you because I lacked traction. I was like riding shotgun. My wife was driving it and I was like, this is boring. And you're like, it was sketchy. I thought it was sketchy. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't have any tread on my tires. So you're fine. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was great. In Moab, it was hot. We went from 107 degrees to 56 and, and drizzly rain. So, well, yeah. Leroy Overlanding says, assume when I use my spare, I'm headed off the trail, not deeper into the woods. That's maybe, <laughs> maybe you Easterners. Okay. But that's here in the West. Yeah. If you, if you've lost your, your uh, spare due to a uh, route, you don't want to end the trip in the trip there um let's see oh yeah and don't forget to replace that winter air with summer air really it's just you know check your tire pressure especially if it's like daily driving rig you know and you don't have tpms sensors because you need dummy lights to know um know your tire pressure um i i like to check my tire pressure pretty regularly actually noticed in my forerunner uh it was a little low on one tire and it was one of my good ones and i kind of want to keep that one good for a while <laughs> <laughs> so one of my good ones. One of your good ones, Ben. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got two that are cupped that need replaced, and then the two in the back are good. But one was a little, little low on air. So. Gotcha. All yeah. right. Well, the next, next one here is to inspect your suspension. So you're going to check for any signs of wear or damage. This includes your shocks, your springs, your bushings, and your control arms. You also should be checking your steerage, steering linkage, tie rods, and your steering gearbox for any wear and tightness. Um, have you guys ever checked your steering linkage for tightness? Yes. Every time I drive down the road and make sure that I don't have death wobble. Okay. That, I, I guess that could be one way to do it. Um, and then once again, I like to throw this in there. Consider upgrading your suspension components. It's that's always pretty, something to consider. Always, always something. To, I my mean, Ben considered it two weeks should, ago. Yeah, my tie rods are, I need to replace them. I'm thinking I just go to long travel front end. Like I, I'll do like exactly. a three and a half long travel. Just if I have to replace my tie rods, I might as well. Yeah. They're right behind Ben on the ground. Look at that. He's they got his coilovers just waiting. They're just waiting. Actually, I talked to Henry. He's going to help me do them. Turning in you are you just looking for somebody else to blame for not tightening the bolts when the yes. tire comes off yes. again? No, actually, I'm hoping that he'll put them on there. Then I'll check for tightness, and because I won't be tired. Hmm. Uh, this can only end well. Uh. Anyways, oh. uh, let's do. Let's move on, guys. Evaluate brakes. So obviously, brakes are pretty important. Uh, no matter what kind of wheeling you do. With the exception of maybe like Baja stuff. I have never seen those guys hit their brakes. Uh, they just throw it sideways and scrub off some speed. But uh, most of us aren't that. So uh, inspect your brake pads and rotors for wear. And hopefully there's uh, quite a bit of wear because they're brakes. So there should be. But make sure there's still enough pad and that your rotor's not absolutely you know paper thin. And you can see the 
actual cooling veins through, <laughs> through the surface of it or something. Uh, or big sure, cracks, big yeah, cracks or cracks. like discoloration. Yep. Like, like uh, your check your brake fluid levels. Uh, a lot of modern cars will actually tell you when it's low, but maybe you could notice it before it's actually low. And also check it for color. Sometimes they absorb a bunch of water and stuff. Yeah, you should uh, really check check your brake fluid. Um, speaking from experience, you don't want to drive off of a mountain with no brake brakes. It's not fun. Also, I highly recommend like if you know your system's leaking, don't just buy like a extra large bottle of brake fluid and go on the trip anyways. Like that's pretty pertinent uh thing to have functional as your brakes. Almost more important than the motor in some ways. Some would the say. good news the good news about like your brakes if if your fluid is low there's there's a reason it's because it's leaked out somewhere it doesn't like get burned up in the engine so you'll be able to find you just have to look for wet spots in the braking system and you'll find them and then you know where you have an issue so and they can not before you come home they can be a fire hazard as well to have uh that leaking so uh also consider uh brake pad rotor and fluid upgrade hey, no not really going to upgrade fluid, but you know, there's, there's, diff there's better pads sometimes that you can switch to and rotors. Yep. And you, can, you can, you can like, upgrade your, you can upgrade your fluid to a different dot number. Um, and it has a higher boiling point for a, a bigger usage and things like that. It's not, yeah, but it's not necessarily an upgrade unless you're, you're like racing it. It actually lasts less. For, for you, possibly, but unless you're the higher, <laughs> essentially the higher in dot fluid you go, the more water that's able to absorb like straight out of the air. So it's not particularly an upgrade unless you're changing it all the time. Gotcha. That That's something I didn't know. Maybe I'm wrong, oh. but that's in my mind for some reason. Yep. Um, let's go on this next one. Inspecting your chassis and body grease fittings. Um, if you've got them, um, lubricating moving parts such as drive shafts, U joints, suspension bonus pre to prevent premature wear and ensure smooth operation. Um, I know, like the fourth gen forerunners, I believe Koi is yours as the drive shaft. Um, we need to write lubricate that fairly regularly. It's got one of those grease zerks. Uh, I know my upper control arms i've got i want to say eight of them that i have like a checklist that when i do an oil change i go through and i just check them with the greaser gun and make sure they've got some grease in there I, i've been fake greasing my equipment at work so long i just get a blob of grease on my finger and hit all the zerks with it underneath so it looks like i greased no. it <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> Oh my it, goodness. it provides the same amount of comfort. Like I feel like I greased it that way. It's the same difference. Uh, inspect right. your undercarriage for leaks, damage, loose components. Off-road driving can expose the vehicle to rocks, branches, and other obstacles that can damage the undercarriage. Unplug um, transmission uh, position sensors and other things. Uh, check the bolts. Ben, up. Ben, I gotta say, I did not like write this article to like pinpoint you at all i i promise i did not put like words and things in here to, to like bring up events that i you've swear had. you're just like you you picked me for the things that i should be doing that I no i just put people in i no i just put people in at random here so um let's see um let's see uh check your bolts on your skid plates you, you know you want to make sure those are good and tight and uh, not loose. Um, you don't want to lose your skid plate on the trail or have it come loose, catch a rock, and damage other things. Oh, yeah, um, mine's come off on the trail. Did it come off on the front or the back and drag? It came off. Oh, it just came <laughs> completely off. Okay. Off. I, I, had a, I hit a rock that was taller than I thought in the middle of the trail, an easy trail, by the way. And I just kept driving. Coy's like, you going to stop and pick that up? <laughs> Pretty sure there's a, a picture of me blacksmithing it back into a shape we could put back yes. on the truck somewhere. Yes. Yeah, there definitely is. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, touch up paint on bumpers, sliders, undercarriage parts. Uh, probably once or twice a year, I go through and hit my sliders with fresh paint. Um, just because, you know, they rub on even just branches scratches off the paint they're not powder coated or anything fancy like that so 
Um, let's see. Clean out debris that may have accumulated. Uh, that have included. you guys ever had like a bunch of stuff on your skid plates, like leaves and I've, branches, collected? mud, clay, mm -hmm. um, in, in my radiator too. Um, every time I go to change my uh, my oil, I dump all that into my eyes, and then yeah. uh, <laughs> get it out. So. Eric says, wait till you get to the part where he wrote about bringing soil to fill in the ditches. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, snap that body panel back on unless it's unlucky to do so. Um, because, you know, I'm still missing that rear fender. It's sitting up on the shelf over there. Um, I'm afraid to put it back on because I know another one will come off. Yep. All right. You're four wheel drive system. So, uh, if your truck's been sitting all winter, if you aren't a winter wheeler, uh, it's a good time to test to make sure it works before you go out. While I was, uh, down in Florence, I saw on Facebook in one of the Oregon off-road recovery groups, there was a guy up not too far from me up in the woods. And he's like, I was up here wheeling and Realized my four wheel drive didn't work and now I'm in a predicament. And I can't get out. The guy was driving a Kia. So, uh, take that with a grain of salt, but it is important to make sure you're Brago testing or that. Sorrento. Uh, Sorrento. Yeah. The, the, um, I know like the Toyotas, uh, like the forerunners the, the, and the Tacomas with the electric actuate four wheel drive systems. Um, that's one you should be doing at least once a month. Engage it, disengage it, um, because it, that fork likes to get stuck because it's not you're not manually moving it. It's an an mm -hmm. actuator, um, yeah. and they get sticky and it sucks trying to get it unstuck and stuck. I I do mine probably once a week. I just throw it in the four wheel drive down drive down the street and turn it off. I do it on my way to work. It's not that, that hard. Sucks. I just. I just grabbed this lever. It has like a J pattern. And then I just, unless I like lose an arm. So I just pull it down and then it goes into four. But that's just me. Uh, that's me. Yeah. Another, another thing you can do is test the lockers. Make sure that uh, they're, they're locking. And then check your fluids to make sure you got proper levels in your differentials front and rear. Um, maybe smell your tranny fluid. Smell if it's burnt. Um, things like that. That's part of... Uh, uh, yeah, and if, if you would definitely smell tranny fluid. Um, if you um do a bunch of mud and all that, it's probably a good time. Mud and water crossings, it might be a good time to go and do a uh, differential fluid swap. Um, a drain and fill. You're kind of cutting into the next. You're cutting into the next one here, Ben. You just well, gotta that's, pump the. That's, four, pump that's the, four wheel drive, though. I said differentials. I did, but let's jump, in, let's jump into drive sort of train, drive train maintenance. Uh, you're going to want to inspect your engine oil or just change it, transmission, fluid, coolant levels, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, coolant levels are important. And once again, you know, it doesn't just kind of burn off on its own unless you have a head gasket issue. Uh, so if it's low, there's, or I should say, very, you know, <laughs> actually pretty low. Ben, once again, we're not. This is not picking on <laughs> not picking on Ben sure, here. It's just maintenance things. The head gasket could happen to anybody. It clearly happens to people, as you know. Uh, yes. So <laughs> everything happens to me. <laughs> so so you're gonna want to check that, you know, and skin color and so on and so forth. Transmission fluid. A lot of the new Toyotas have a sealed transmission fluid. There's no way to track it. So stop looking if you have a Toyota made after. I don't know, 2010, stop looking for the dipstick. It doesn't exist. Uh, just believe that it's good. Uh, top off, replace fluids as needed. Straighten and blow out the fins in your radiators. That is something that does definitely get overlooked, especially if you do a lot of mudding, uh, a lot of farmers and loggers and, you know, construction workers. That's a thing you got to, you do have to just take a, you know, a light pressure wash to your radiator every so often and get that stuff blown out of there. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, sitting behind Aaron in Nevada really dirtied up mine. Don't have to change yeah. it if you're always topping it off. <clears throat> you got to go me. faster. Uh, replace air filters. Check your air filter. Replace your air filter. So on and so forth. If you're Ben, 
you don't have to do that because he has a pre-cleaner and he will he will empty it on his hood and show you how much dust he saved his air filter every single night. Uh, every single I love it. it. I find it. I actually look forward to Ben emptying it out like a Kirby look, vacuum look, salesman on a hood. Look, look what I got in my pre-filter today, guys. Ugh, that's not He's in my so engine. I did about it the whole time. <clears throat> Uh, check hoses to your remote location diff breathers. Those can pop off. I've definitely seen those just hanging. Yes. Yeah. That's that's worse than just having the stock ones. Uh, consider upgrading your radiator if needed. If you're having a lot of uh, heat problems, there's no shame in upgrading it. Or even just sometimes you got to, those things can get kind of gummed up in there. And sometimes they just actually need replaced. They're pretty cheap too. I mean, you can get them inexpensively or you can spend a lot of money like on an all aluminum one, but radiators aren't that bad. Yep. I've been told I've been told that they are a a um consumable part on a vehicle too, like a water pump, things like that. You, you can only clean it so many times before you maybe you want to swap it out. Yeah. It starts catching more and more gunk. Um, let's see, uh, talking about more and more gunk, uh, performing vehicle. I can't say that specific. specific. Yeah, there we go. Specific maintenance. Um, follow the manufactured re recommendation for service intervals and address any known issues or recalls. Um, don't pretend that those issues are not <laughs> issues. Um, and some of those recalls like trimming your floor mats are stupid. So don't bother with those, but you know, ones that are important like your ford ones are very important to go get taken care of uh also let's talk about the electrical stuff so um you want to test your headlights your tail lights your turn signals you don't want to get pulled over coming to and from the trail because you got some lights out it's one thing to break those lights on the trail and then have to explain it to the officer that you're just on your way home from wheeling uh, but you if you can check them, fix them ahead of time, uh, check your battery connections and condition, maybe even tuck off, tuck off, top off the fluid in there. Make sure you use distilled water. You don't want the minerals messing up your batteries. Yeah. Uh, clean, and then clean those, make sure to, clean the battery connections too. That one's one that got me. Shocker. Yes, very. <laughs> I, I would have never guessed that maybe you would have had battery problems. <laughs> uh, and the last thing is make sure all that janky wiring you did is tucked away nicely with zip ties or in a wire loom. Um, if you got time, fix it, straighten it up, zip tie it to things. I got to yeah. I got to read something in the comments. <laughs> Eric Hoover says, is there a way to test your airbags? <laughs> Travis says, there is, but you won't like it. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I did not like testing my airbags. That's for sure. They work that good though, right? Sure. No. Sorry. That was, the, the ones sometimes there's some just gold in the comments and we got to like stop and just be like, I have to, I have yep. to give Travis his due on that. The live uh, I uh I also want to point out uh I was pointed out too, I guess I should say, on a wheeling trip once that my tags were over a year expired. Uh the DMV <laughs> doesn't always send you a notice, let you know you should buy Whoops. new ones. And uh I don't really check. Like I, I wait for the DMV to tell me mine are bad, like or sometimes I wait for a police officer to let me know they're bad. Uh it's not really my guy kind of thing. I don't even run a front plate, so I never would look from the front, wouldn't matter. And I just uh I'm not behind my own vehicle a lot. So, you know, sometimes those tags and then also check your state uh, off-road permit. Most states, at least on the oh, good West points. Coast, yeah. have an off-road permit. They go bad, I think, every two years here in Oregon. And a lot of times they're not compatible with other states. I buy them every so often, but make sure that's uh, good. Uh, review your recovery gear. Ensure that you have necessary recovery equipment such as toe straps, shackles, and or high lift jack. And then take your high lift jack off and put it with your farm equipment like it should be. Uh, <clears throat> inspect all, excuse me, inspect all of your uh, recovery equipment, your ropes, so on and so forth, and verify that your winch is in working order. 
I cannot explain how many times I've been on the trail and people's winches didn't work. It, I, I'm actually, there's, I'm, I'm not surprised even when they're like, I can't get my winch to work. I'm like, oh, okay. It's like, I've seen it so many times. It's not even funny. Yeah. I've had, um, I went to use my winch and my controller, um, was the problem. It was damaged, uh, because I have how I was wrapping up the controller when I wasn't using it, the, the cord itself. Um, and also take the time to clean your recovery equipment. If you've used it, like your winch line, run it through some soapy water, rinse it out. Um, cause all that mud in there with your synthetic cable, if you're running synthetic, um, all the mud and dirt in there will break it down and you could have your winch line snap and at a bad, t- bad time. That, a- that applies to kinetic ropes as well. I usually at least once a year, I, to the dismay of my wife, I fill up the tub, throw my rope in there. And then like <laughs> every day throughout the week, I walk in there and I shake it around, move it a whole bunch and then drain the, it'll just turn the water brown. You know, I'll drain it, fill it back up, come back the next day, stir it all around. She really likes it when I do that. Uh, and then, uh, uh, sorry. Leroy says Eep sounds like she has really grown. Eep is the name of my dog. I don't think that barking was on my end. No, it's my neighbor's dog right on the other side of my fence, and I'm going to have to go outside and yell at it. Okay. Well, you got to do this next one first. Oh, yeah, I'll do this next one. Um, Stock up on essentials like food, water, first aid supplies. Um, Those are all um, perishables. Um, Your first aid supplies can go bad. Make sure you're checking dates on that. Um, Maybe update what food you have in your rig. Maybe Maybe get some fresh taco sauce. Um, get that survival pack, <laughs> the mild sauce. Order that new Taco Bell survival kit. Yeah, get that Taco Bell survival kit. Um, and and uh, include your emergency tools such as a shovel, tire repair kit. Um, you know, make sure you've got all that packed up and you know where it is. Um, because if you're digging through and you have to rip apart your rig to find your recovery gear, or your your survival kit or your first aid kit. Um, it's kind of not so handy. Same goes for your fire extinguisher. And, and if you've got a CO2 filled, uh, fire extinguisher, hit it with a hammer and make sure you break up. Um, cause that stuff likes to pack together. So shake clumps, it, yeah. it, break up the clumps. Um, that way you get the full, um, use out of it. All right. Uh, if you uh, you're, not wrong, Eric. you're not wrong. If you camp while you are out wheeling, um, you might want to check over your camping gear, which might mean opening up your tent and making sure all the. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right, Coy. Um, opening up your tent and making sure the poles are all there. Um, gather up your kitchen parts. I am super guilty of after having a wheeling camping trip, bringing pots and pans and utensils into the house. And then they get set, they get cleaned and then they get set aside and they don't make it back out. Um, so I don't, I don't know about you, Koi, um, if you have any of those issues or not, but I, I am guilty do. of not doing almost every single thing on this list. <laughs> I, I, I'm <laughs> just being honest. I've skipped. I've, I've not done a lot of the stuff I should have done many times. So, and Ben clearly more than me, but still, uh not wrong i'm as guilty as anybody of not checking their oil before they leave on a trip like i mean it's just things you don't always think of you know i've never had oil issues it's usually been cool oh man you said that out loud why would you (laughs) (laughs) wait there's wood lots of wood around here knock on it quick yep knock on it well uh aaron you better start packing more extra oil because i only bring a quart and it's synthetic which i'm sure ben doesn't run so no i run synthetic and i've got two quarts i keep two Uh, quarts then okay well uh uh, trailer maintenance guys obviously trailer maintenance is something that you need to do which i actually need to do right now my main trailer Still yeah. has the brakes absolutely smoked from my Moab trip when I locked the brakes up. Yeah, I need. To I didn't think. Train. I didn't think about this, but this could also apply to the trailer that you might load your 
or Wheeler onto. It I kind of made this list. Definitely for doesn't have to be your just camp a trailer. Camp yeah. trailer can be an off your your tow rig trailer or whatever you want to call it. Uh, not everybody that listens to the show is probably like us that has the Overland style build. Hopefully, there's some real wheelers on here as well. Uh, you're gonna want to check your wheel bearings regularly for wear and proper lubrication. That is probably. 90% of your trailer maintenance is your wheel bearings. Like that's by far the most important. And if you could stay on top of that, you won't be the trailer on the side of the road with the wheel off of it, uh, driving around, trying to figure out how to get another trailer to drag that trailer onto, to take it home. Uh, inspect trailer tires for proper inflation, tread wear and damage, especially if you don't store your trailer in inside the sun is probably the number the sun and use of tire is the number one killers of tires and the sun will ruin a tire quicker than you think from just sitting in one spot <clears throat> if equipped with brakes inspect brake pads rotors brake lines regularly adjust and replace brake components as needed that's honestly pretty if you're using your trailer properly the brakes last a long time so it's not super big issue but still something you do need to keep an eye on and inspect trailer suspension systems including leaf spring shocks suspension bushings for signs of wear or damage uh ensure all trailer lights including trailer brakes turn signals taillights are functioning properly uh i have problems with that occasionally <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my father-in-law's pop-up like there's always one light that is always malfunctioning in that thing yeah it's it's always a fight dude and in my my day job i'm constantly and it's like is it the plug on the truck is it the trailer do we put this on like it's just a, uh the more you use a trailer it seems like the more you have the light issues uh check electrical connections and wiring harness for corrosion or damage inspect trailer coupler and hitch receiver for signs of wear or damage lubricate moving parts and ensure proper engagement between trailer and tow vehicle and also noticed if you put your two and five sixteenths ball on or your two inch ball <laughs> or your one happen. and seven eighths. Yeah. If you have a trail, I try to run two inch ball on everything I have so that I don't have this problem, but I've seen it happen multiple times where they have the two inch ball on, they back up their trailer that takes two and five sixteenths and it doesn't take long before you're dragging the trailer down the road. It's not, it's not very good for trailers or the back of your truck. Uh, check safety chains for proper attachment and condition. Uh, also your breakaway. If it's a, you know, a trailer big enough that needs a breakaway, it should not be connected to your safety chain. It needs to connect to the truck directly. Uh, what? when your trailer comes off and that's hooked to the safety chain, a lot of times it doesn't actually engage it. So, so that's, uh, I, I wrap that. mine in the chain like i wrap it like once around the chain and then to the vehicle that should be good enough right uh you should just go straight to the vehicle should be independent of the chains oh okay i think better fix that then next time i mean if honestly... everything if everything rips free you want uh that breakaway device to be still attached to the vehicle so it yanks the mm, yeah yanks the thing yeah. engages the batteries although do any your be, does your trailer actually have that is it big enough to have my rockwood have does my rockwood yeah. does okay. it's so, fancy. yeah you want it separate so that it doesn't actually like if the trailer falls and it's hooked to the chain and it like pinches it off and then it's just then it doesn't pull it so you want to kind of have that separate from everything or you want to run one not as all is which where i'm kind of leaning now after i mine got accidentally pulled uh Inspect trailer undercarriage for damage, corrosion, or loose components. See, Aaron did that preemptively and got yes. uh, good there. And yep. inspect trailer frame for and body for signs of rust, cracks, or structural weaknesses. Remove dirt, mud, and debris that can accumulate during off-road drips. This helps prevent corrosion and prolongs the life of the trailer components. And if you have a uh, trailer that you're loading something up on and it has jack stands for the back of the trailer that you have to run up and down when you load and unload things, go ahead and run those up and down and <laughs> see if they work. Like that's mm. over winter. That stuff can rust up solid in there. Montana dirt road says anything larger than a single axle utility trailer is required to have a breakaway. Um, your state, your laws may vary. 
Um, a lot of states do it by weight or size. Um, in Oregon, you don't even have to have lights. You don't even have to register your trailer or have lights on it if it's under a certain size. So under a certain of, size and you can see the lights on your certainly vehicle. yeah that's a good point yes yeah, yeah it can't just be blocking all the lights of the tow and vehicle you would be surprised how many trailers weigh under 1800 pounds like <laughs> uh, a lot of oregon's trailers uh, at least most, most of them they have a max capacity of 1800 pounds and they don't run plates or insurance or anything on them i just read that them. I just read that law. I read up on that law last week and it's a, um, that's the gross vehicle weight also. So that's the loaded weight. It's not the unloaded weight. So yes, my, my, my dad has a large or had a large, pretty good sized two axle trailer. Uh, it would, if, if it had a rating, it had to have been eight to 10,000 pound. You know, yeah, <laughs> I cop pulled him over because he didn't have any plate. But the first thing cop walked up to the window and was like, "Hey, how much? Uh, how much do you think that trailer weighs?" And he literally had like two yards of rock in it. And my dad just straight up was like, eighteen hundred pounds. Just weighed it on the scale. <laughs> just weighed it." <laughs> <laughs> cop like looked at him, looked at the rock. I was like, "Come on, man!" And he's like, eighteen hundred dollars. Tell you, <laughs> he, he just went. I don't know what to tell you. Good night. <laughs> He is definitely yeah. your father, isn't he? Yeah. I like uh, what Leroy says. He says, make sure your dad didn't take the plate off and use it on a different trailer so you don't get a ticket. So, yeah, make sure those plates are on there if they're supposed to be on there. I had somebody do that to a dump truck I was driving one time, and then I got pulled through the scales. And turns out they can tell when a plate doesn't belong to the truck you're driving immediately. Oh, no. And the Waymaster oh, has no. a that you absolutely don't have the answer to. It was super nice of our of a fleet manager the company I work for to, to do that. Wow. Uh, all right, guys. Next week, it is the hypothetical Copart vehicle purchase slash road trip. So we're doing one of our hypothetical road trips again, guys. But we got go to go to Texas. We're, we're heading to Texas. We're coming to see you, Eric. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be hot, and we're gonna get a totaled vehicle. Yep, we're gonna have a hoot nanny. <laughs> we burned through, burned through all the money that Toby willed us, and now we're buying, auction cars. So. buying crashed auction vehicles in Texas. Uh, Eric, deep. we might need to use your driveway to do some of these repairs. So yeah, we gotta actually go through this entire list on these things and a little more because somebody tested the airbags in these vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's exciting. Well, thank you everybody who listens to us weekly and also to those who watch us live on YouTube. Uh, Eric says we'll meet at Bucky's. That is a fabulous idea. We could work on a parking lot of Bucky's. We appreciate you guys. Uh, we had a really strong comment section tonight. Um, it's a lot of fun having you guys there. Make sure you're sharing us with your friends, helping us grow and God bless America. Don't forget to visit Patriot Patch and join the Patch of the Month Club. Check out our Gaia affiliate link for up to 40% off. Also, don't forget to head over to Warren Colby Valve and 4 Patriots to see all of their great products. We are a proud part of the Firearms Radio Network. Got a question or comment? Send it to us through our Linktree account or by searching for Off-Road Podcast. Also, you can listen to us live at overlandradio.com Mondays at 7 p.m. Pacific. One Off-Road, please remember to have fun, tread lightly, and be safe and courteous. Thanks for listening. There it I've is, got, folks. Well, Koi's the winner. I've got four seconds of video to show you just how much fun I had fishing. That was the downpour we were experiencing while fishing. Very fun. Did I hear someone yell, get off my finger, homie? It was a very good possibility. Those kids were having fun.